All right. Here's Jolene Adams. She's the newly elected regional manager for ARS, regional, Western Region, and she's doing a program on chemical safety. Jolene. Thank you, Gary, for inviting me to present this program. All CRs that are uh, attending and are on the attendance sheet that Gary will send me after the seminar will receive one continuing education credit for this lecture, which is a mandatory lecture for all CRs. So chemical safety. We've got a big bias in the West and in other regions in the country against using chemicals, the word chemical. You know, they, they want to have beautiful roses, but they don't want horrible, horrible synthetic chemicals. Okay, I want to remind you, chemicals are what makes your body. You're made of chemicals. Everything else is made of chemicals. So let's not get all knotted up about chemicals and let's get to the root of the problem, okay? So here we go. <laughs> First of all, you know, you get on the internet, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and you get these really strange things. Um, here's some examples. Uh, called from over the years. People really believed these things. And you know, the few people that believed that the end times were coming and they went up onto the hill on Mount Hebron and it didn't come, how disappointed could they be? They felt they were rejected. You try some of these things, that's still not, they're still not gonna work. That's ridiculous. That's hooju, okay? I want to remind you that everything that we deal with in our life is made of chemicals. You're made of chemicals. The speaker here is made of chemicals. All of the products on the table that he's telling people about are made of chemicals. Chemicals can be organic or inorganic. They can be harmful or helpful. Don't get upset about the word chemicals, okay? There's common stuff that you've used in your house or maybe your garage all the time. It's all made of chemicals. Were you scared to use it? No, you used it anyway because you used it according to the directions and you haven't died yet. A chemical. Common definition of a chemical, it's a product or a substance that's produced using a process involving changing atoms or molecules when you mush them together. The term is sometimes defined as a substance. That's from the lab manual. Chemical means of or pertaining to chemistry. And chemistry is the study of matter and its transformations. And that's where I spent a great deal of my time when people actually paid me to do these things. In your life, you must use common sense. Come on, think things through. Don't fall for all that stuff you see on the internet. These are just examples. Use common sense, okay? If you're going to use any kind of product on anything, whether you think it's safe or you think it's woo, crazy, here's what you got to do. You read the label. Follow the directions on the label. Don't add more. Don't add less. Do exactly what the label says. Store the product in the original container if you haven't used it all up. So that kids and pets can't get to it. Protect your own body. Wear protective clothing. Don't go out in shorts or a bathing suit and flip flops when you're going to spray chemicals on your garden, whether they're organic 
or manufactured. They can kill you. Don't mix them with each other unless the label says what you can mix. Don't use more than the label says you should use for what you're doing. It always says, you know, for roses, use two tablespoons per gallon or three teaspoons per quart or whatever. Do it that way. Don't add more. More is not effective. Every label on every bottle and can and box has a use it by date. Even your beer has a use by date. Every time, check it. Use that stuff until, and if you haven't used it up, take it down to your hazardous waste site and get rid of it. It's no longer stable. Trust me, in our chemical lab, I had so many students blowing things up because they were using old, outdated chemicals that had been stored in their desk. Didn't use the fresh stuff. So do not do this. Don't share these things with other people. There's a specific way if someone wants some of it that you can give it to them. Keep it in its original container. Give them the whole container with the label. Let them use what they want and have them give it back to you. Do not decant it into a smaller container. Don't handwrite a label. That's illegal. And if something bad happens, the boys in blue are going to come and get you. You cannot share it. If you want to allow Gary Chin to use what you just bought, you have to give him the original container so that he's got all the information and then he gets to give it back to you. After you've used any kind of chemicals, and I mean, even household, if, I mean, if you're going to fumigate the downstairs where the cat, you know, did a thing on the carpet, uh, you need to go ahead and clean it up with whatever you're going to clean it up and then go upstairs and wash yourself and put your clothes in the washer because chemicals volatilize. They, they get up into the air. They float around and the molecules will get on you and your clothing. You don't want to carry that around. Wash yourself, wash your clothes. And just in case, you need to know the number of the Poison Control Center. You can call them from any number anywhere in our country. Here they are. Poison Control is 1-800-222-1222. How hard is that to remember? 222-1222. And it's an 800 prefix because it's free. They will talk to you, find out what you used, alert the nearest physician to where you are, and help you take care of yourself if you've screwed something up. Or if someone else has screwed something up, you know? The guy out in the garage changing out your battery, splashes it all over himself, falls to the ground writhing, call 222-1222, area code 800. Be responsible. Read the label on anything that you're going to use, whether it's chemically based or organically based or synthetically based or from grandma's fruit locker on the website, read the label. The label has to tell you the directions, what disease this can be used against, how to apply it, when to apply it, it gives you tips about it, whether or not you can combine it with anything else you have and how it works. The label tells you all of it and it always gives you where you can call for more information, the manufacturer, the poison control center, and all of the precautionary statements. Same thing that I've just been telling you. Always read the label. So what else does the label tell you? It will tell you what clothes you need to wear. No bathing suits in the front yard. No shorts, no sandals. You protect your whole body. Um, 
whether you're spraying a liquid or a powder or an aerosol, you don't want it on your skin. Okay, skin absorbs these things, not good. So you need protective clothing. We recommend either a long sleeve shirt and pants all the way down and shoes that cover with socks, no sandals, no shorts. You could use a Tyvek suit. They're cheap. You can get them at any hardware store and they're reusable and washable for about three or four washes. You need chemical gloves, not rubber gloves, not the vinyl ones that are used in hospitals. No, no, no. Some chemicals can eat right through them in 35 seconds. Chemical resistant gloves. And for your feet, not your sandals, not your tennis shoes, chemical resistant boots because you don't want it getting onto your skin. You need goggles that cover your eyes all the way back so that it can't leak in down the sides or a face shield and a hat. If you're going to spray with liquids, you're going to need a respirator because liquids you know, will volatize into the air. They float around. So you need a respirator that you're breathing through little uh, filters that screen that stuff out so it doesn't get in your lungs. If you're gonna spray with something dusty, you need a dust mask. Yeah, who knew? After you're through, wash your hands and your face. Better yet, shower off and wash your clothes separately from any other clothing. Protective clothing. The label will tell you about protective clothing. Why is it important? Because chemicals, this is an important statement, chemicals can enter your body four different ways. A mist or a dust or a splash can land on your skin somewhere usually when you're mixing two things together. But sometimes it gets volatilized on a hot day and it can steam up into the air and go into your eyes. That's also dermal. But skin, it, it can get to you. It can get in your mouth. If you're eating or chewing gum or smoking or talking to your neighbor while you're spraying whatever you're spraying, it can get in your mouth because it's misting into the air. You do not want that to happen. It can get in your nose because you have to breathe. It can also splash into your eyes because again, you might have a mist coming back at you because the wind is in the wrong direction and you're not wearing protective goggles, not wearing protective glasses. It'll get in your eyes. And did you know your eyes have skin on the top surface of those eyes. And this stuff goes right through the skin. Again, that's dermal. If you protect yourself this way, you'll reduce any hazards or complications from whatever you're using. Back to the label. The label will tell you what active ingredient is in this product so that if you screw up, and call poison control, you can tell them what you were spraying with. Uh, the label will also warn you about the dangers to wildlife or our waterways. We've got that huge bay out there. We also have the Delta. Did you know that this Delta, the Suisun Delta, is the largest freshwater landlocked Delta in the United States? It's extremely important to animals and fish and boaters and people who use it for water. What plants or pests it can be used on, it's always on the label. Don't use it for anything that's not on the label. It'll tell you what stage of that plant or pest it will kill. Whether it's the nymph or the egg or the adult, it will tell you. 
It will talk about pre and post emergent larvae versus the adult species. And it will also tell you how to store this container and how to dispose of it and a whole lot more. This is, <laughs> this is a, an MSDS, part of, of what an MSDS will show you. Uh, that's the manufacturer's safety data supplemental paperwork. <clears throat> it's usually not on the label, but every single place that you can buy these things, these containers of chemicals has to have an MSDS stored mm. on their property. So you can request access to it and look at it. <clears throat> you can also download your own MSDSs for what you have in your chemical locker. We'll get to that in a minute. But the MSDS will tell you the active ingredients that are on that pesticide label. It will tell you the signal word it will tell you how much is in that container. It will tell you the trade names that it's sold under. It will tell you the active ingredients and what it can do to you and why and what the law is about that active ingredient. It can tell you uh, how to maximize, minimize, or avoid the use of these products that contain the active ingredients the inert ingredients that are also there. Inert ingredients, okay. Whenever you've got a bottle of liquid or a box of dry material, whether it's groceries or something for your pesticide locker or something for the garage, inert ingredients are necessary because they keep the product from clumping or dissolving out and flocculating to the bottom of the can and getting solid and then there's nothing in there for you to use. Inert ingredients make things flow when they're supposed to or not flow when they're not supposed to. It will tell you about everything that is in that container. This is a material safety data sheet. And if you're using either biological synthetic or natural chemicals, you should get an MSDS sheet for your little notebook that's in your locker with all of the products that you spray for your roses. And of course you all have lockers, right? Yes, mom, we have lockers. <laughs> okay, all right. How could this product hurt you? Okay. If, if you get the product on you or in you or something happens, you need to know the LD50. This is cute, not too romantic, but it's straightforward. This LD stands for the lethal dose, dose 50, 50%. So pharmaceutical companies, like I used to work for Allergan, and we, we did a lot of work for ophthalmic things for surgical reasons. And we used big bunny rabbits with big pink eyes, okay? We always had to know the LD50 for whatever we were testing on the rabbits to find out whether they were gonna die or if it would work or et cetera. 50 means However much you give the test subject, 50% of them will die at a certain concentration. Okay, that's the LD50, that's the killing point. It's always expressed as milligrams per kilogram of the body weight of the test subject, okay? That drives Americans crazy because we did not convert to the metric system. So just remember that the lower the number of the LD50, the more toxic this is. And if you like math, one kilogram is the equivalent of 2.2 pounds of body weight of the test subject, like a rabbit 
or a cat or a beagle dog. And for Americans, 28,561 milligrams equals one ounce of a liquid. One ounce of some of these things can kill a baby. Okay, so the lower the number, the more toxic. Here's a little chart of commonly used things in our garden. We've got seven and DDT and malthion and, oh, methaprene, by the way, this is used in flea collars for your dogs and cats uh, and in other things because it, it's a juvenile hormone mimic. It won't allow the eggs when they want to hatch to become larvae. So the fleas can't keep breeding on the back of your cat or your dog. That's what how flea colors work. Yeah. Not lethal to the animal, not lethal to you. Notice the LD50 is 34,600. Come on, that's not gonna get you. Nicotine is 50 to 60 milligrams per kilo of the test subject, that's rough. Pyrethrum, we often use that. It's made from chrysanthemums. We thought it was wonderful. It happens to be really toxic. Rotenone, which is rat poison. Um, it was also used, I don't know if it still is, for people who have clotting sim syndrome, older adults usually, so that they won't clot, so the blood can go freely. But in in rats and squirrels and possums and things that you might use it against, it causes them to bleed out, which could happen to you. Rotenone, 132 milligrams per kilo. Sucrose, 29.7. Eh, copper, metallic dust. Well, you shouldn't be breathing metallic dust. You're wearing your face mask, right? You're not breathing the dust into your lungs. Okay, well, 6.4. Caffeine, 192. There goes your third cup of coffee in the morning. You should not drink that. Um, I buffer mine with milk. <laughs> Insecticidal soaps, usually really safe. I mean, a real high LD50. It takes a lot of this stuff to, to kill the test animal. It's not going to happen to you. Sodium bicarbonate, which we use every day in our foodstuffs. Yeah, it's got an LD50. Sodium chloride, which is table site. Yeah, it's got an LD50. Boric acid crystals, which we use commonly to keep ants from, from coming in the house. Um, they don't like boric acid. And if you sprinkle it along the edge of your foundation or wherever the ants are trying to come in, it will stop them from coming in most of the time. There are other things you can use now. But the examples here are something you need to figure out. Signal words. Every label on every product has a signal word so that those of us who, who can't read or understand will at least be able to see. If it says poison, It'll have a skull and crossbones. You can't get that stuff unless you have a pest application license. They don't sell it in the big box stores. They don't sell it in specialty nurseries. If it says danger, here's the stuff we can buy. If it says danger, it is highly toxic. And the oral LD50 is <laughs> to 50 milligrams per kilogram of the body weight of the test animal. And you know the test animals. You know, they're rats and mice and rabbits, okay? So, but still, if it's got an LD50 in the danger zone, watch out. Then there's warning. This is moderately toxic. It'll take a while, but it'll get you for sure. The LD50 here is above 50 and below 500 milligrams per kilogram. It's just waiting for you to use too much and then it's going to get you. Then uh, the slightly toxic things are cautions. There are two cautions 
I don't know why, but the first one is slightly toxic from 500 milligrams. And the second one is slightly toxic from 5,000 milligrams per kilo, less toxic than the other one. Caution is caution. Caution is caution. Watch out. It builds up in your system. Some of these things are residual in our bodies. Some of them go right through and they're gone. You can't trust them. Be careful what you're using, even if you think it's safe. The signal word for these, poison, danger, warning, caution, caution, are always on the carrier or the material container. Always. Federal law. So let's look at some labels. Here's orthospongenex. It says danger right there. Right there, danger. This is a fungin fungicide. It says caution. Okay, the label gives you the signal word and a list of the ingredients. They're usually too small to see. I would recommend you take a loop with you, uh, you know, the one that you have for looking at very small insects, things like that, or magnifying glass. So you can read these because uh, although the manufacturers are required to put these on the product, they're hoping you won't read them. So they're very, very tiny. Read them anyway, you need to know this stuff. The label gives you the signal word and a list of the ingredients in that product. Now, here's how it can get to you. Through your skin. It can go through your skin and the skin on your eyes or any exposed areas of your body. This is the most dangerous exposure for rosarians because we'll be in the garage which is not ventilated, right? We don't have a fume hood over us like I had in my chemical labs. And we're mixing stuff and it splashes and you get a little on your arm and you just wipe it off. Thermal exposure through the skin or it's fuming, it's bubbling and, and you didn't put your glasses on yet. So it gets into your eyes, slight burning, but you know, you put a few eye drops in there and you think you're fine. Not necessarily. It can be through your mouth. If you're eating while you're spraying, or you're smoking while you're spraying, or you're picking your teeth while you're spraying, whatever you're doing and your mouth is open, it can get in there. What's inside of your mouth besides your tongue and teeth? Mucous membranes. Mm. All of the inside of your mouth is very vulnerable to absorbing anything that goes in. That's the way it was made. But they're not showing the pictures right now. The your mouth closed, basically. Orally, you could swallow the material. I don't know why you would do that, but maybe you're eating a sandwich while you're spraying and it gets on the sandwich and then you swallow it. Or maybe you're sucking your thumb or maybe whatever, it could get in there. Inhalation, you can bring the material vapors and that usually occurs when you're mixing in the garage or in a garden shed where there's no breeze or anything and it's just kind of fuming up a little bit and you're still breathing, you don't have a, a respirator on or a mask, you'll get it in through your nose, it'll go into your lungs and that's how it can get you. Okay, if you're looking at problems in the garden, figure out what's going on. What do you think needs to be fixed? Are the leaves showing symptoms? What, what symptoms? What are they showing you? What does it look like? What is it characteristic of? Do a little research. Are the petals showing symptoms? Of what, what could be going wrong? Are the stems and the foliage dying? Why? Your CR manual has a whole chapter on this. Why would it be drying up and dying? Is it a plain old ugly rose? Can you replace it? Well, why not? 
plenty of nurseries. Regan's opening up late in this month for mail orders. Good heavens, don't put up with nasty crap. All right, if you're gonna spray, you've gone out there and your garden is a mess and you're saying, oh my God, I gotta do something. Think about it. There are all kinds of sprays. There are all kinds of products. Some of them are organic, which means they're made from natural substances and they can kill you just as fast as anything else. Some of them are termed chemical or inorganic, which means they're made in a lab and they can kill you just as fast as the organic stuff. So one's not better than the other. Do not be fooled by the big O that marketing wants you to believe. If it's organic, it's better. Not necessarily so. A pesticide kills pests, any kind of pests, okay? A biocide will kill microorganisms. An insecticide will kill insects or bugs. Fungicide will kill funguses or fungi. A miticide is also called an acaricide and it kills mites. An herbicide kills weeds and other plants that are nearby. Think of Roundup. A rodenticide kills rodents makes them bleed out most of the time. An oocyte will kill the eggs of insects or mites that might be on your plants because insects have invaded. Okay, and of course, homicide kills people, but we don't want to. There are many reasons for that to happen. Okay, here are the modes of actions on how pesticides can work. They can be selected. Pesticides, whether manufactured or organic from nature, will kill only a few related organisms, related in a family of the type, you know, like a, uh, a snail and slug killer will kill snails and slugs, but nothing else unless it's covered in a mucous membrane. I'm being attacked by my cats. A broad spectrum mode of action. It kills lots of pests and they'll be listed on the label. Contact, it will kill on contact with the target pest. Systemic will kill once it's inside of the host plant. So it has to soak in through the leaves and stems and into the plant. And then when whatever is bothering you pierces the dermis of that plant, that's when they get the dose of the systemic pesticide. It can be a residual, which remains toxic long after it's applied. It just sticks on that plant. It can be a fumigant. These are not good because they're very volatile in the air. You have to be covering your mouth, nose, have a respirator if possible. Fumigants will be inhaled by the actual pest organism and it will Kill them. It can be a repellent, which is something that just is very distasteful to the pest. It doesn't taste right. It makes them itchy, scratchy. Uh, they'll avoid it. It's like uh, snails and slugs don't like to crawl through sand because it's scratchy. Repellents are disgusting. Okay. So how does IPM fit into all this? Integrated Pest Management is our program for monitoring and controlling our insects and disease with the least adverse effect on the environment. Means you are watching and seeing what's happening. You're monitoring. You're controlling the insects and the pests by using the least toxic method possible. And you're recording what worked and what didn't work so that next time you get an invasion of one of these things, you won't make the mistake of going back and doing the dumb thing again, you're gonna do the smart thing. So IPM, and controlling with least adverse effect. I want you to figure out the problem before you jump to conclusions in what's happening in your garden. 
use biological controls where possible because mother nature already knows how to kill these pests. And if you use the biological controls, yeah, it takes longer, but it works every time because mother nature has had thousands and thousands of years to figure out how to do care of these pests. You should start with the least toxic material, whether it's chemical or biological and move up if necessary. Never go to the kill everything, burn it to the ground syndrome. Don't do that. Start with the least toxic. And if all possible, please use sustainable gardening practices. When you spray, don't spray on a windy day. Well, duh. Just like Superman's cape, you know? You don't try to grab Superman's cape. You don't spray on a windy day because it's going to turn around and blow it right in your face. Don't spray on very hot days. Why? Because it will dry that stuff immediately. Even in the air before it even lands on the plant. So it's a waste of time. Don't do that. Spray just enough material to cover the entire plant, the top sides of the leaves, the stems, and the undersides of the leaves. And that's enough. If it's dripping, it's enough. Use just enough of the material to take care of the problem or the potential problem. Don't overspray. Make sure your pets, cats, dogs, ducks, whatever you've got, horses, are locked up until that spray dries. You don't want it getting on their fur, feet, feathers, or fins. And if you spill it, use kitty litter or sawdust. Soak it up, then scoop it up and bag it in a plastic bag for disposal at your hazardous waste site. That's the easiest way to solve that problem. Avoid wasting your money and your energy and your time. Don't use homemade remedies. It's like, you know, the cabbage soup to lose weight diet. Don't get on the internet and see that somebody says, oh, you know, if you put this with that and shake it up three times, twirl around twice and spray it on your roses, everything is no, no, no. Buy it from a reputable company. The company has done the research, they've done the tests because they don't want to be sued. And they know the product is safe if you use it according to the label. After you've used a product, whether it's biological, organic, or chemical, dispose of the container when it's empty. Use it up in your sprayer. Uh, if there's only a little bit left, spray it on the ground and on the grass and on other plants, whether they need it or not. Use it up, don't store it. It's already been diluted, it's not going to be stable. Rinse your sprayer and spray out the watery stuff on the ground or on the grass or on other plants. Triple rinse that empty container, drain it out on the grass or on the ground or on other plants, wrap it in newspaper and put it in the trash. Or if your community has a hazardous waste collection site, which in California, every community has one, take the containers to that site. It's free and they will dispose of it properly. Remember, as a consulting Rosarian, you are responsible for your own health and well being. Take care of yourself. You're responsible for your family and their health and well being. You're responsible for the health of your own garden and your pets and your neighbors and your friends and the earth, and it just goes on. You are responsible. If you're spraying, you need to be very careful that you're doing what's lawful, what is recommended, and at the proper dilution of the product, and that you're taking care of the sprayer and the remainder of that unused product 
in the right way. Never recommend a product that is not available at your garden store or your big box store or is not labeled for use on ornamental plants. It might not say for roses, but roses are ornamentals. Some uh, products are specifically for roses. That makes it easy. But any ornamental, roses are ornamentals. More is not better. If you add more in the water, the pests are not going to be controlled any faster. You're going to waste the pesticide and your money. You could actually injure your plant because the mixture will be too strong. It will, and you can contaminate the environment. And of course, needless to say, you're breaking the law. So. Here is a good resource, the Pesticide Information Center. This is hosted at uh, Oregon State University, but the University of California has input and several other universities across the country also have input to this site. So it's a collaborative effort to give you, the public, all kinds of information about pesticides. It can show labels for you and what's happening with pests or wildlife and what the labels look like and the fact sheets and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a good thing to know. It's N-P-I-C dot O-R-S-T dot E-D-U slash G-E-N dot H-T-M. That's the general entry point. Now this is an old picture. They've, they've updated the picture. They do it every three months. But this is a good site for pesticide information. The state of California also has an information site, but this is a general purpose program for the nature. So NPIC. Okay. And if nothing else matters to you, let mom help you. Lace wings. Spiders, lady beetles, parasitic wasps, more bugs that can eat bad bugs. Mother Nature is a natural born killer. <laughs> she has everything in balance. Trust her. And as a CR, most of all, be safe. Wear your suit. <laughs> Wear your gloves, wear your mask, wear everything. And <coughs> this is Kitty Belendis from Southern California. So thank you for sitting through this program. And if there are any questions at the end, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Yes, excellent. Most of you have been through this before. Uh, if I can make it better in any way, let me know because I'm always ready for updates. I have to check these chemicals before I give this program every time to make sure things haven't changed. But uh, it's a good basic program and it's funny and factual and it's easy for people to remember. Mm -hmm. Cindy, you got something? Just agreeing. It's very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like oh. the part about uh, reminding people not to spray in, during windy days. Uh, at my former home, at Koi Pond, and I was out of town one weekend for a Koi event, and I came home, and I found uh, all my Koi floating at the bottom of the Koi mm -hmm. Pond. I took samples of water. A friend of mine says he knew a place up in Oregon that could test the water, set the water samples up there, and they indicated that what they found in the water were things that are found in pre-emergence. So I suspect one of my neighbors was spraying 
over the weekend and it got mm -hmm. into my yard and into the pond because my koi pond was in the corner of my yard and there's like one, two, three houses in that corner that any of them could have gotten me, but nobody would own up to it. Of course not. But yeah, this is, um, uh, it goes back to the good neighbor thing. You can't force your neighbors to be good neighbors, but you can be a good neighbor. And you can talk to neighbors about how you're being a good neighbor and you're taking these precautions and you're warning them and just hope that they get the idea. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Yeah. So, Bugman, have anything to add? Well, you know, the only thing I, uh, that uh, Jolene didn't mention is that uh, when you spray your garden, you have to uh, tell your adjacent neighbors that you're what you're doing because, uh, you know, just so that uh, they can put the cats away or their pets away and wife away or their husband away <laughs> so that uh, exactly. so that that's, they're that's informed part of being the good neighbor yeah right yeah. plastic yeah, because, over my koi pond to keep that stuff out <laughs> the the question that i had all the time was um you know they would see me uh in my tyvek suit with uh, my respirator and everything and this and they were kind of uh concern about that so they kind of um, uh, but if when they're they told me ahead of time then they know what's happening and why yeah. that's why um, uh, that's why I always told them what uh, what I was I was doing sure sure I think out in California most of us don't use anything I mean we don't spray or in Northern California, we don't, we don't do a lot of that stuff, but in Southern California and other parts of the country, yeah, uh, they do a lot of that stuff. Yeah, and this is a national program that I do right. across the country, so I have to hit all of them. Yeah. Yeah, Northern California is more conscientious and they're trying to go to biologicals and natural substances. And then I have to remind them that these are just as poisonous as the other stuff, even if they're natural. So still, I mean, this is not a lecture on what to spray. This is a lecture on being safe. If you spray anything, be safe. And how to be safe and how to take care of yourself and your garden and your pets and your neighbors and your etc. Oh, I do have a question. Yes, sir. It's, it's maybe more of a, a soil question, but I, I think it does relate to chemicals. I'm in a community garden and the lady next door to me is from the Ukraine. And I went over there the other day and she was putting um, baking soda all over the ground and turning it into the ground. So I don't, you know, that's a chemical. Don't know what it's supposed to do. I looked it up on the internet and there's various things, but I think all of them are kind of like, does it really help? <laughs> I was just curious, um, you know, something like that. That's calcium bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. Or sodium bicarbonate. I don't know why she would be doing that other than she's trying to sequester carbon. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things they said on the internet was it could make your tomatoes taste better, but I don't think they've really proven that. <laughs> okay. uh, my advice, stay off of the internet. <laughs> These people, you know, you go back to that front part of this program, the crazy things that were cabbage soup diet, and etc. all from the internet. No. No, 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 no. Always go to a science-based site yeah. for your information. Um, you know, my grandmother used to do strange things. My mother used to do strange things. I used to do strange things. Baldo used to do strange things. He, he, he still does strange no, things. <laughs> uh, hey. no, go, go to a real site that has scientific yeah. information and get the truth. Don't go for fads like 
the cabbage soup diet and mm -hmm. 24 hour fast and all that. No, no, no. Yeah. Well, I imagine people would have to spray that have uh, chili thrips and that kind of thing. So this is a really good program because yeah, some of that so stuff I think is pretty nasty, isn't it, that you have to use? Yeah, it is. Uh, chili drips is in our pests program, and uh, that stuff is pretty bad, and you have to be very careful. But again, we assume you're going to wear your suit and your respirator and your mask and your safety goggles, and you're going to cover your hair and make sure it doesn't get on you, etc. And that still might not stop the chili drips. They have a mind of their own. Kind of like cats. <laughs> yep. Any other comments, questions? Well, I'll go no. ahead and stop the recording for now. Mm -hmm.